The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the third age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose in the mountains of mist. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time. But it was a beginning. The Wheel of Time is a legendary series at this point. Some would say it is the series that took us from under Tolkien's shadow and acts as a bridge into the modern fantasy landscape, introducing many of the ideas and themes and tropes that are very popular and common in uh, the books that come out today. Indeed, um, modern fantasy legend Brandon Sanderson, my king, got largely famous due to his work in helping to finish the last three volumes of this behemoth of a series. It took me two and a half years to finish this series, but I did it, so I'm very proud of that, and it is now <laughs> my time to rank all the 14 books of The Wheel of Time plus the prequel New Spring. Let's get started. Also, I apologize in advance for the awful lighting because we have a storm today. So we're working off my artificial light. So the first book in The Wheel of Time is The Eye of the World, and I liked it. You know, maybe it's the nostalgia now, but I remember picking this up in, I believe, March or April of 2020. So, you know, the start of the pandemic. Guess what, bitches? <laughs> Coronavirus! Coronavirus! And just reading about these characters, you know, Rand, Egwene, Matt, Perrin, Nynaeve, just living and vibing in their cute little village. It was just so heartwarming, you know, like I loved it. This is spoiler free, I believe. So do I'll include minor information about the characters and plot, but it's truly not that much, so I think you should be fine. Don't worry. It's just cute, you know? It has so many memorable sequences, like the escape from Shutter Logoth. Loved it. It also sets up a lot of stuff. It's not my favorite in the series. It was quite difficult to get through some of the parts, but honestly, in my opinion, Robert Jordan's writing style at this point wasn't the uh, drawn out, very descriptive that we get during this log. It's gonna be my first eight year. I really enjoyed it. Moving on to the next book, The Great Hunt. I was obsessed with this book. I was obsessed with this book and it goes straight to S tier. Hear me out, right? So I watched Daniel Green's ranking. He says it's good, but it's not like great. So when I went into this, I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. I mean, this book starts off with a punch. Right from the get-go, you know, there's the attack at Faldara, Matt's condition is worsening, so that's an entire plot line. We have Egwene and Nynaeve being taken to the White Tower and starting their training there, which I was obsessed with. Like, I love magic schools and also just like getting to know the culture of the Aes Sedai more. You have the entire portal stone sequence. The Shan Chan come and at this point it's like this new force. So they're taking slaves um, of women that can channel. Everything culminates in like this fantastic, fantastic, fantastic finale where each of the characters of our Emmons Field 5 has like actual real stakes for them, um, like personally, but also, you know, like societally, obviously. This book is also the one that introduces the idea of death is lighter than a feather, duty is heavier than a mountain, and it introduces it through this character who has an amazing arc throughout the book. And it's one of the first kind of hints at the foreshadowing that Robert Jordan is able to pull off on the greater level of an entire series. The third book is The Dragon Reborn. I really enjoy the concept of, oh, like the book is titled The Dragon Reborn. We are barely following The Dragon Reborn. Um, I believe it was To the Ramble, uh, my favorite booktubers right now. It said that they calculated how much of The Dragon Reborn is in the actual book. Guys, it's not a spoiler. If you can't figure it out from the first chapter, then I'm so sorry. Rand has a total of like 2.5% of the uh, of the POV uh, chapters in this book. And everything else is like the all the characters chasing him. I liked the concept. 
I liked the concept. I thought it was fun. However, at this point, this episodic nature of the books kind of started to tire me out because it was the third book where we're uh, following a path, you know, exploring the world until it all culminates in like this final battle, even though uh, the battle that happens at the end of this book is very important to the greater prophecy and it, it missed that it factor. Maybe it's better on a reread. I'm so sorry it is going to be a B for me. Book 4, The Shadow Rising. I think it would be fairly apt to say that it's this book is the overall um, fandom favorite book um, because it is truly when the Wheel of Time ditches that episodic nature and uh, takes takes its own path um, towards creating its own identity, right? We leave the part of the map that we have spent like our entire um, books 1, 2, and 3 in, and we start to explore the Isle Waste. And I did enjoy this book, however, again, I think it's one that is better once you uh, read it in hindsight. There were some moments that did drag for me. There's so many intriguing uh, plot lines like Ruidion, and, uh, you know, Matt starts doing his, uh, Matty things. Very important book. We explore the Aiel culture, I, and this is where you start to really see, um, on a much more in-your-face kind of way, how Robert Jordan found exploring cultures, um, interesting, and thinking very logically, like, how would these people have developed over the centuries if this was where they started? Like, we obviously saw this on a lesser scale in um, the previous books where we'd explore Faldara or Tyr or Toman Head, but here you, you truly, truly see something totally new. For all those reasons, I'm gonna put the Shadow Raising um, into A tier. I will put it above the Eye of the World because, again, just it, it's better, it's more exciting. Um, and structurally, it's very important to the entire series. Alright, so book five was The Fires of Heaven, and straight away I'm putting it into S tier, just below The Great Hunt. So this book is very high on exposition at the start, but that's because it is really setting into motion a very decisive battle um, that happens towards the end of the book. So other than the final battle and the absolute uh, craziness that occurs there, it's... Still thinking about that does something to me. But um, the two highlights for this for me, um, other than that, were Matt and Nynaeve. Nynaeve, in my opinion, in this book takes this morally gray turn, which really surprised me because I didn't think that out of all the characters, um, you know, from our Emmonsfield five, she'd be the one to turn kind of morally gray, but I was so here for it. Then the other highlight was Matt. So I really enjoyed seeing how, how this persona that he has crafted of this like playboy, lucky gambler guy, uh, how it starts being, you know, deconstructed. Now we go to book six and straight away this is also going to be an A tier for me, but just under uh, the Shadow Raising. So I really, really enjoyed Lord of Chaos. I'd say that here is where Rand's crazy side starts really showing, and I really enjoyed it. There's also the entire question of, you know, what do we do with the male channelers? And it all culminates in this final uh, sequence, which uh, is very traumatizing, but it's so interesting. It also builds the relationship between uh, Rand and one of his love interests. It was a bit slow for the first big chunk, but that final part really, really built up for it and made it all worth it, in my opinion. Now we're moving on to book seven, which is A Crown of Swords, and this is going to be my next B tier for me. I'm going to put it above the Dragon Reborn, I think. So yeah, here's where I want to start talking about the dreaded slog of the series. I'm firmly in the camp that the slog does exist and it is very real. However, I do not believe that it starts in book seven. I think it starts in book eight. I enjoyed this book more than most. However, there is something that I really want to talk um, about, and that is the mistreatment of Matt, mainly the sexual assault of him. The way he's treated was absolutely disgusting, and more than that, the way that Nynaeve, Elaine, and all the women in his life, uh, when he was like turning to them for help, were uh, treating this, were, was just like laughing it off, and I kind of got the sense that when Robert Jordan was writing this, he was writing it for comedic relief. 
and it just made me very uncomfortable. But that being said, there were parts of this book that really, really uh, delivered on the promises that were being made from book one. You know, all the stuff with Lan and Nynaeve. So cute. So love love that. And I'm gonna put it above um, The Dragon Reborn. I don't think it was bad by, uh, by any means. It's just that one aspect that really brings it down for me. Okay, so now we're on to book eight, the, pack of the, the Path of Daggers. And for me, this is where the slog started. It wasn't terrible. I gave it perhaps a 5 out of 10 if I remember correctly, but just compared to the highs of the series prior to this, it just couldn't compare at all. I think the big part of this book that uh, was underwhelming was the structure. It seemed like just separated vignettes randomly collect connected together. I'm extremely confused. You're confused? I'm fucking confused, bro. A lot of the time it just seemed pointless, you know? I believe this really could have been shortened. It wasn't as bad as an offender as the next book on this list, uh, which is my greatest enemy, Winter's Heart D tier. I made, I believe, three attempts with this book. Man, this book was just awful. It was awful. There's nothing in this book that I found enjoyable besides the last chapter. But if the last chapter is enjoyable, that doesn't make the rest of the book enjoyable. It was awful. There was one scene with Rand that I liked, and there's one joke that Cadswain makes uh, towards the ending of the book. But again, it's just two scenes, or like, with the joke, one line of dialogue that I enjoyed. The rest, no character, maybe besides Matt, had any progression. Each chapter was way too long, could have been condensed, at this point, I was also sick of all the Aes Sedai that, like, you know, all start with the letter S, Suirin, Sierin, whatever, like, all those S names. No, I don't know any of them. It just read, like, okay, random Aes Sedai, insert here, okay, blah, next. D tier. Next is Crossroads of Twilight. Again, D tier, but above Winter's Heart. Crossroads of Twilight is probably the fandom's least liked book, if The Shadow Rising is its favorite book. Crossroads of Twilight has the structure of following a random character whose story didn't finish in Winter's Heart, uh, leading them up to the event of the last chapter of, the, of Winter's Heart, and then jumping to another perspective and just repeating that over and over again. Yeah, Perrin, my god. I couldn't stand his portions. I was so sick of every chapter being him walking through an encampment or whatever and pointing out every single person who's walking past, describing their shoes. I didn't care. Plotline doesn't have to go on for like four books. Now we make our way to a Knife of Dreams, which I'm gonna put into A tier. I'm not sure where. Uh, below the Shadow Rising, but above Lord of Chaos. That's um, that looks good to me. This is Robert Jordan's final book in the series, and I really wanted to leave the series off um, remembering um, Jordan on a high note, not the low note of A Winter's Heart and Crossroads of Twilight, and this book really delivered. Uh, all these plot lines that were dragging on for so long all come to a conclusion here. A lot of interesting uh, things that were foreshadowed from the first couple of books come to pass and I'm very happy that he had the opportunity to um, finish uh, these storylines before his sickness um, got really bad. Book 12 is going straight up to top of S. Uh, to be honest, the ones in S tier are very close to each other in my head, so truly distinguishing which one is first, second, and third it's just minor differences, you know? Like, this might change by the day. The Gathering Storm is where Sanderson takes um, uh, takes the mantle from Jordan and uh, bases the work off of Jordan's works. And this is the book that focuses more on Egwene and Rand. I talked about it more in my favorites of the year, so if you want to have a bit more information on um, why I enjoyed it so much, go watch that video. But it was quite interesting to me at this point. I'm, I'm fully Team Egwene, you know, where earlier she really pissed me off, now I really liked her. So you can see why Egwene had to be so annoying and naive and uh, bratty uh, earlier on, because without that, uh, she wouldn't have been able to become the woman that she is in this book, where she really takes the lead and and does some incredible things. Um, there's another character who I won't mention, but they have one of the biggest WTF moments at the end of this book, which I didn't see coming at all, and I think uh, paying attention to them on a reread is something I will definitely do. The next book that I have is Towers of Midnight, and 
I think this is Sanderson's favorite of the three that he wrote because his favorite character was Perrin. Here's the thing. Perrin was one of my favorite characters in the early stages of the series, but by the end, man, I just wanted to be done with him. I wanted to be done with him. After spending all that time with him uh, during the slog, I just, I couldn't be bothered to read more about him, and this book is mostly Perrin. It has a little bit of Matt here and there. I love Matt at this point. Love, 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 love Matt. But Perrin, just couldn't stand him anymore. But yeah, B tier. It wasn't terrible, gave it a 6 out of 10, but... For the final book, A Memory of Light, it's again going into A tier. Um, I'm gonna put it just... Mm, it's quite on the same level for me as Knife of Dreams, so... Oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, I'm gonna put it above Knife of Dreams, but below The Shadow Raising. The prophesized final battle is finally against us, and it's uh, crazy because the chapter in which it takes place is... Um, it's 200 pages, so it's longer than the first Harry Potter book, <laughs> but it's so worth it. So worth it. It's crazy when you have such a long book series to finish, like 14 books of setup and payoff, but this book did it so well. So, so well. There are parts of this book that are fully written by Robert Jordan. I actually cried when reading uh, those segments. It just felt like coming home. Okay, and now really quickly before I finish the video, I want to talk about the prequel book, New Spring, and I'm going to put New Spring into C, above the Path of Daggers. It adds a lot to the lore of the Aes Sedai, and it builds up uh, Moraine and Lan's uh, bond and friendship. It just didn't impact me as much as I hoped it would. And I think this is just a question of me having too high expectations when going into it, especially since I read it after book five, which was um, a really big high for me. I, I just think I had too high expectations for it. That was my total ranking for The Wheel of Time. I really, really enjoyed this series. It is really up there as one of my favorites of all time despite hating on some of the books quite intensely i overall thought it was a fantastic journey you know every time i read that first sentence it was like coming home and i cannot wait to reread it in the future because everyone says that it's even better on a reread so yeah thank you so much for watching this video if you made it this far please like comment and subscribe and i'll see you in the next and i'll see you in the next one Mwah.